Great, thank you, Dr. Chang. So, uh, uh, my name is Kareem. I'm a medical student at the University of Toronto, uh, so very far removed from where Dr. Chang is, but uh, my talk will be uh, uh, much less technical, much more focused on the outcomes of our uh, initial trials. So uh, at Sunnybrook Research Institute, we've been investigating focused ultrasound for the treatment, uh, surgical treatment of refractory OCD and major depressive disorder. Uh, and uh, I, I'll fly through the background because I think everyone here can probably appreciate that OCD and major depression are amongst the most uh, debilitating and common psychiatric disorders. And uh, despite optimal medical management, around 30 to 40 percent of them uh, of cases are uh, uh, symptomatic. Uh, and uh, for these refractory cases, sometimes surgical treatment may be beneficial. So to investigate the use of focused ultrasound for non-invasive surgical treatment of these diseases, we uh, initiated a phase one trial. Uh, and the main outcome, uh, because it is a phase one trial, uh, is the safety and feasibility of this approach. We also uh, assessed the initial efficacy using uh, psychiatric symptom severity scales, the Y-box for the OCD and the HAMD for major depression. We did neuropsychological testing. Uh, and I think one of the interesting aspects of our trial is that we also included quite a bit of neuroimaging, and, and I'll get to that in a second or in a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the primary outcome, as I said, is safety. And what we found is that there's no significant adverse events associated with this procedure. Um, and uh, there are some mild adverse events that are transient in nature, like headaches, facial swelling, or uh, scalp burn or tingling uh, that's light. Um, and again, these are, these are uh, transient. There were no uh, permanent motor, sensory, uh, or neuropsychological changes associated. Uh, in terms of the initial efficacy, I've put both uh, the OCD and MDD results we have so far. Again, this is preliminary data, but what you can see uh, first focusing on the, uh, the right side uh, with OCD, uh, you can see that uh, there's a mean percent reduction of uh, 39%, and uh, all three patients had a, an immediate and sustained improvement in uh, their, their symptom severity. Uh, major depression, we have data up to six months right now for just two patients, and uh, it tells a bit of a different story where there is, uh, an, there is an improvement overall of around 21%, but one of the two patients had a, a significant improvement initially and then a bit of a relapse. So uh, it's too soon to tell, to make any conclusions off this data, of course, but uh, it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, in terms of the imaging results, uh, we used, uh, in addition to regular structural imaging that you would uh, expect from any focused ultrasound procedure, we've also been using trictography. Uh, and we have an in-house procedure, uh, a workflow for uh, integrating trictography into imaging, uh, into targeting for focused ultrasound. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with DTI, uh, a gross uh, oversimplification is basically that uh, it, it tracks the diffusion of water inside the brain, and white matter tends to have alignment of uh, or diffusion along a particular axis, whereas gray matter is more random. So you can, you can see that the anterior limb of the internal capsule maps out pretty well, actually, using trictography. Uh, and you can see that postoperatively post and at three months, uh, we've effectively interrupted those tracks. Uh, trictography is a more qualitative uh, assessment of DTI. Uh, we also looked at it more quantitatively using a measure uh, known as fractional anisotropy. It's been mentioned a few times today, uh, but basically, uh, people don't really like it uh, when you describe it like this, but it's essentially a, a, a description, uh, or it's essentially a measure of white matter integrity or alignment. Uh, and basically what you can see is that uh, from baseline to post-op, uh, once we've disrupted those white matter tracks, the alignment decreases significantly. Uh, what's interesting here is that it actually seems to increase again after uh, about three months and, and is persistently increased almost to, the, almost to the level of baseline at 12 months. Uh, we're not really sure uh, what exactly this means, um, and, and this is, again, preliminary data that needs to be explored further. Another interesting thing we found here is that the difference in the fractional anisotropy from baseline to post-op, in other words, the amount that we've disrupted the alignment of the white matter, is actually significantly associated with the change in the Y-box score long-term. So in other words, we can, we can uh, use this, uh, this DTI as a, a biomarker for uh, predicting how well the surgery is actually going to reduce uh, the, or is actually going to improve symptom severity. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the purpose of this trial was again to, to demonstrate safety and efficacy of this approach. Uh, and uh, uh, what we found is that focused ultrasound is promising. The initial efficacy results are promising, but uh, it, again, that's not the purpose of this trial. Uh, it's still ongoing and we'll be updating results uh, as we get them. Uh, and I think neuroimaging, there's a lot of potential for uh, MR, MR approaches like DTI and functional magnetic resonance imaging to inform our approaches and to be used as biomarkers to 
uh, A, predict how well a surgery actually went, and B, to predict maybe who's actually going to respond better to these surgeries. Uh, and I think that one of the more uh, interesting aspects of focused ultrasound is the potential for MR integration. Uh, and uh, that's all I have. Thank you uh, for your time, and I'm open to any questions.